Hysteria, a hilarious history of hysteria. Welcome to the Theatre Royal Stratford East and to this audio introduction to Hysterical. Hysterical is a monologue written and delivered by Rebecca Buckle in which she shares with us her experience of the condition she suffers from and relates it with illustrations of the way women's health has been viewed since the beginning of time. Rebecca is the presenter. She's a woman in her mid-thirties with a pale, intelligent face which betrays no sign of hysteria. Her shoulder-length dark auburn hair is smoothed back into two neat braids. Her makeup's immaculate. Her dark eyes are outlined with black eyeliner. Her full lips are painted vibrant red. Occasionally, the faintest suggestion of a slight smile plays across them as if she's sharing a joke with us. She wears a black top under a flowing, sparkly black jacket and round her neck hang the words Hysterical Woman in rounded, shiny, metallic pink letters. There's a small red heart linked to the W of woman. As she speaks, Rebecca faces us from behind a lectern, which is placed in front of rows of laden bookshelves. From time to time, she's viewed in more intimate close-up, when the camera closes in even more tightly on her face, often focused only on her mouth. Her lectures illustrated with line drawings, etchings, photographs and puppets which illustrate historical theory or depict a biblical or historical character and these appear fleetingly on the screen. Sometimes she dresses up, adding items of costume to become the characters she's referencing. The first historical character is a long-haired, bearded, ancient Greek seated at a desk with writing materials. He looks towards us. Rebecca adopts this character, wearing a long, bushy, obviously fake grey beard and a white sheet draped over one shoulder like a toga. She illustrates his theory with a puppet, a large pink cushion shaped like a womb with fallopian tubes that dangle like arms from the sides, ending in sparkly blue ovaries. They dangle loosely as the womb hides among the plants in the jungle, while Rebecca becomes a topi-wearing explorer, peering through the leaves. As she tells us more of her symptoms, she illustrates her point with small red stickers with grumpy faces, which she sticks onto her limbs and face. When telling us of Eve's encounter with the snake in the Garden of Eden, she uses puppetry. The snake's a green glove with two large yellow eyeballs attached to the fingers, and Eve is a very basic glove puppet with yellow wool for hair and three strategically placed fig leaves. Her bright red lips are very similar to Rebecca's own. As she continues her journey through history and time, she adds a silver-coloured Elizabethan ruff around her neck and a floppy black velvet cap is perched on the side of her head. For the era of Napoleon Bonaparte, she dons a bicorn hat, coupled with a white lab coat. Later, she adds a stylish fawn hat, brown shawl and fingerless black gloves as a Victorian woman. Eventually, Freud appears, reminiscent of a ventriloquist dummy, bald-headed, with a fringe of wild white hair, bushy white eyebrows, round black spectacles and unkempt white beard. Rebecca meets him on a Zoom call, Freud participating from in his wood-panelled study. During their Zoom encounter, as the alternate and main speaker, they will fill the whole frame, the other relegated to a small Zoom box in one corner. Both are wearing white headphones. From time to time, Rebecca also appears in flashbacks as her younger self in a doctor's surgery. These scenes are in stark black and white and are heralded by the noise of a crowd as Rebecca looks around. Here, her younger self sits in profile, wearing a knitted cardigan, her red hair loosened over her shoulders. She's face to face in consultation with a male doctor. The camera focuses her clasped hands. We hear the doctor, but only his hands are visible. Due to the nature of Rebecca's performance, we shall be keeping audio description to a minimum. And also, she herself makes it very clear. On the title page now appears the image of a woman in mid-screen, her mouth wide open. Her face is fragmented into separate colours, red, yellow, light, then dark blue, focusing to white in the centre. And the audio described performance of Hysteria will begin now. Hysterical, a hilarious history of Hysteria 
a digital lecture. Written and performed by Rebecca Buckle. Rebecca appears on screen and addresses us. Hello, my name is Rebecca and I'm a hysterical woman. A few years ago, at the age of 34, I was diagnosed with a condition called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Many women wait decades to be diagnosed with EDS, and we all have a similar story. Years of pain, fatigue, memory problems, dislocations, stomach issues, breathing issues, allergies, malady after malady with no apparent cause. So, doctors do the routine scans, often in a way to appease you, because they've already decided that your symptoms are psychological. But what has my medical diagnosis got to do with hysteria? Well, many of my symptoms are the symptoms of hysteria, but they're also the symptoms of several other illnesses and disorders that primarily affect women. Generally now though, when we think of the word hysteria, we think of the image of hysteria. Hysterical laughter, hysterical crying, fainting, the wonderfully dramatic Hollywood slap of a woman who just won't calm down. And it is always a woman. Because men are passionate, men are emboldened, their laughter may be maniacal even, but it's certainly not hysterical. Because hysteria is a woman's disease, a pretend woman's disease, because it doesn't actually exist. But it's a diagnosis that's been placed on women for nearly two and a half thousand years and continues to affect the way that women are dealt with by medical professionals today. But where does our notion of hysteria come from? Where does our tale start? Chapter one. The wonderfully wacky world of ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks were fascinated by the differences between men and women, but Greek doctors weren't allowed to examine women as they did men, so they had to use their, pun intended, rather fertile imaginations. For example, some imagined that the female reproductive system was a form of lesser penis, literally a penis that had been turned inside out and inverted into the body. Noted physician Galen thought instead the uterus to be an inverted scrotum, trapped within the female body because women lacked the necessary heat to force it out. They also thought that both men and women produced sperm. Naturally, women's sperm was weaker and women were created by this weaker sperm. Many of these theories formed much of the logic of women being less worthy than men in Grecian society. It is worth noting though, that many of the theories laid down by the ancient Greeks, like the inverted penis and female sperm, were believed right up until the 17th and 18th century in Europe. Here, for example, is a drawing of an inverted uterus penis from 1563. The big man on campus of Grecian medicine was Hippocrates. At the doctors. So, Miss Buckle, what can I help you with today? Miss Buckle? Oh, uh, yeah, so I've been having trouble sleeping. Um, well, I sleep too much, probably. I'm just so tired all the time. Do you think it could be stress? Are you worried about your exams? I don't think so. Just the usual uni stuff. First year doesn't count, right? When did the tiredness start? Um, when I was about 13, I got ill with a virus and I didn't seem to get any better. And the doctor said it was post-viral fatigue syndrome and it had sorted itself out, but... Well, I imagine it's just student life getting to you. Too many evenings down the pub. Do you drink much? Oh, uh, well, you know, student. <laughs> How do you feel about gin? Um, it's all right. Well, I recommend having a little gin tea before you go to bed. Should send you straight off to sleep. I'm sure you'll feel better in no time. <laughs> Alcoholism, that well-known cure for chronic fatigue. Who was I? Oh, Hippocrates. There are different pronunciations. Hippocrates, if you're an American and wrong. Hippocrates, in a questionable Greek accent, but for today, we'll stick with Hippocrates. Because the womb was the only major difference Hippocrates could see between men and women, he supposed that the womb was the origin of all disease in women. The Greek word for womb was hystera. And in turn, Hippocrates coined the term hysteria. 
And he and his contemporaries had some interesting views about what the hysteria could get up to. The central idea at the heart of Greco-Romana history was that of the wandering womb. It was believed that the womb was a separate entity to the rest of the body. In fact, some scholars went so far to say that it was a separate living animal contained within the human body. Arataeus wrote of it, In the middle of the flanks of a woman lies the womb, a female vicious, for it is closely resembling an animal. It moves hither and thither within the flanks, and in a word is altogether erratic. It smells and advances towards them, and has an aversion to fetid smells and flees from them. And on the whole, the womb is like an animal within an animal. Plato believed this so wholeheartedly that he supposed if the womb was deprived of sexual activity for too long, it could remove itself from the body altogether and go looking for satisfaction. Just imagine all these little wombs running around Athens at night like some ancient Greek version of Tinder. But what symptoms did this wandering womb cause? How could you describe a classic case of hysteria? Well, the first symptom was suffocation or difficulty breathing caused by the womb rising up and lodging itself under the diaphragm. This was accompanied by muscle spasms and temporary paralysis. Over the centuries, however, the symptoms of hysteria came to describe almost every physical trait a woman could suffer from and her personality as well. If a woman was too sad, she was hysterical. If a woman had angry outbursts, also known as uterine furies, which I think is a great phrase, she was hysterical. More importantly still, if a woman didn't obey her husband, she was hysterical. Many women were sent to asylums under the guise of hysteria, just because their husbands had grown tired of them or they wished to take a mistress. If I were alive in antiquity, I definitely would have been diagnosed as a hysteric. If you were doctors and I came into your clinic room and rattled off my list of symptoms, you'd think I was hysterical too. So let's have a little look at them, shall we? I've got some stickers, some grumpy little stickers, and we're gonna stick them on where there's an issue. Right, first off, my joints. This is the big one. People with EDS can't produce collagen properly, so that means that my ligaments are too flimsy to hold my joints together properly. They're unstable and prone to going on little adventures without my permission. I mean, I can even pull my fingers right out of their socket at will. I won't, though. Collagen affects every organ in the body, by the way. And then there's dysautonomia and MCAS. Dysautonomia is the autonomic system not working properly. That's the bit of your brain back here that controls things you don't have to think about, like breathing. So for me, that means brain fog, not being able to remember things. I pass out when I stand up too fast. I'm generally a bit dizzy all the time. I'm generally a bit nauseous all the time. I suffer from tremors, particularly when I'm tired. And I am always tired. And then there's MCAS, which is mast cell activation syndrome. It means I'm allergic to anything and nothing. MCAS causes you to have allergic type reactions without allergy and on a whim. This might sound like a lot, but it's only the tip of the iceberg, pretty much. The only part of me that is functioning properly, ironically, is my womb. And we've gone off track. So how did they treat the wandering womb? Well, that was dependent on which school of thought you followed. Galen believed that the imbalance in the womb was down to trapped menses or trapped female sperm. And if women were never having sex, then how on earth was she to release this sperm? So Galen's remedy was sex and lots of it. Hippocrates sometimes also suggested sex, but he held more firmly that hysteria was a disease of older women and widows who had stopped having sex. So their uterus had dried up and floated up into their abdomen. There were also recipes for balancing the humours and magical talismans, but my favourite treatment was fumigation. Today, if we hear the word fumigation, I think most of us are going to think about bug bombs and those big tents that you put over houses to get rid of pests, and not as a cure for women's problems. But in ancient Greece, it was a legitimate cure. How did it work? Well, if we remember the words of Arataeus, 
The womb could smell and had a particular aversion to fetid smells. So if the womb was too low, weighed down by all that sperm, you could put a sweet smelling poultice under the nose to entice it back up, whilst blowing smoke up you are to stop it from coming back down. And if it was too high or just generally in the wrong place, you could burn nice smelling herbs or a nice fragrant balm rubbed all over your bits. Not all scholars were so clueless to the function and the anatomy of the womb. Here we can see the jug-like womb of Sorinus. We're missing the fallopian tubes and the ovaries, but the shape isn't bad. Contrary to Galen's popular seven-chambered womb, there's three chambers on the left for producing boys, three chambers on the right for producing girls, and one in the middle for producing people who are intersex. Obviously. Chapter 2. Adam and Eve After the fall of the Roman Empire, things fall quiet in our hysterical history. The medical teachings of Hippocrates, Galen and their contemporaries are now deemed, well, pagan heretical nonsense and banned by the early Christian church. And then we had Eve. Hello! For those of you who don't know, in Christian doctrine, Eve is one of the founders of the human race. She was created from the rib of Adam, who was created in the likeness of God. They lived in the Garden of Eden having a jolly nice time, and there was only one rule. Do not eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. So they're happily bumbling around the garden, and one day a snake comes up to Eve and is like, Oi, Eve, have you tried these apples? They're like totally amazing. Oh no, I'm watching my figure. These fig leaves don't leave much to the imagination, and God said it would be awfully bad form to have a little snackaroo from that tree, so berries it is for me. What are you talking about, girl? You've got a great figure. It'll be one of your five a day, you'll never know. So, Eve tucks into a bit of fruit with a hubby Adam, and next thing you know, the big finger of God comes down and is like, guys, I had one rule. So God throws them out of the Garden of Eden. And here's the important bit, gives all three of them a cruel and unusual punishment. For Eve, it was that she would suffer in childbirth and be ruled by her husband, because she had proven that women were silly little creatures who couldn't be trusted to make good decisions. These few lines in Genesis are one of the most important things written about women in human history. Not only did they take away the rights of women to be independent, as was common in many pagan societies, but they also outlawed a lot of medical treatment for women. Because to treat a woman's pain, especially in childbirth, was to go against the divine word of God. But not all was lost. While we were busy planting turnips and doffing our caps to feudal lords, Islamic scholars in the East were actively studying, translating and using the teachings of the ancient world, particularly of Galen and all his sperm. In the 11th, 12th and 13th century, this information began to flood into mainland Europe and accompanied another important event in our timeline, the foundation of the first universities. With the advent of the universities came the first scholars outside of the church and an increased interest in medicine. OK, Ms Buckle, you were booked into the wrong sort of appointment, so I've not actually read your notes. Give me a quick overview of what's been going on. Well, I have these episodes where I can't breathe. Well, I can breathe out, but I just can't breathe in at all. But... Any other health problems I should know about? I've recently been diagnosed with Alice Danlos syndrome and I've read some studies regarding EDS and pulmonary issues and, and floppy airways, and I wondered if maybe that was part of it. Alice Danlos, mm, never heard of it. Uh, well, there seems little point in carrying on with the appointment until I've done some research. I'll refer you to the pulmonary physios and see you in six months once I've had a chance to look into it. I never did see them or the physios. I was discharged from service again. Do not mention your own research. It very rarely goes down well but Doctor does not always know best. Chapter 3. Witches There was another legacy that came from Eve, the concept of all women being inherently evil or sinners. The early leaders of the Christian church didn't believe in magic or witchcraft, but that changed with the teachings of Thomas Aquinas, where magic and witchcraft became tangible threats once again. But how does this impact our history of hysteria? 
Well, the symptoms of bewitchment are the symptoms of hysteria. The image of the witch is often that of hysteria, the young lusty woman or the haggard crone. It's the persecution of witches that led to hysteria once again becoming a viable medical diagnosis. The first British book on hysteria was written in 1603 and had the rather catchy title of a brief discourse of a disease known as suffocation of the mother, which have of late on occasion, it goes on, it's very long. Edward Jordan wrote the book following the witch trials of Elizabeth Jackson. Jackson was an elderly woman who was said to have cursed and bewitched a young girl named Mary Clover in April 1602. Mary began to choke and fit. She suffered from temporary paralysis and used ventriloquism to chant, hang her, every time that Jackson was near. Pretty dramatic stuff. When it went to trial, Jackson had many supporters who believed that Mary was either faking it altogether or suffering from a good dose of hysteria. Edward Jordan was one of those supporters and testified at her trial, but his opinion was not a popular one and Jackson was convicted of witchcraft. Mary Glover still went on to experience symptoms and eventually sought exorcism. In response to this, and prompted by the Archbishop of London, Jordan wrote suffocation of the mother not only to try and protect women, but also denounced the idea of demonic possession, which was Catholic ideology at the time of Protestant rule. More dangerous still to the Archbishop was the rise of prayer-based exorcism in the Puritans. Mary Glover was a Puritan. Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder general who murdered 300 women in a two-year period, was a Puritan. And the most well-documented case of mass hysteria relating to witchcraft happened in the Puritan community of Salem, Massachusetts. On a lighter note, we do know, however, that hysteria in this period is still using ancient methods of treatment. Here's a fumigation device from 1610. The bottom part is a brazier for burning herbs, and the item that looks a bit like a hunting horn was used vaginally to allow smoke to enter the womb. Slightly more sophisticated than holding a woman over an open fire, but only slightly. We don't know how common a diagnosis suffocation of the mother was, but it was at least common enough that at one point during this period, it became illegal to bury a woman until she had been dead for three days, just in case she was suffering from hysteria and not really dead at all. I would love to see the stats of how many women magically sprang back to life after the third day, but I don't have those stats and there isn't a lot of progress during this period, so let's jump forward a few hundred years. Chapter four, Charcot. We've left the ancient past and we move on to more modern medicine, a proper doctor, a neurologist, and one of the most important men in our history of hysteria, Jean-Martin Charcot. Very French, very sexy, Charcot. Except now that every time I say his name, a tiny northern woman at the back of my brain goes, Jean-Martin Charcot. What sort of a name is Jean-Martin Charcot? But with Jean Martin Charcot, we hit the Victorian era and the Salpetria Hospital in Paris. Charcot isn't well known outside of medical circles, but he is one of the founders of modern neurology. Charcot's work and the work of his students went on to form the backbone of modern neurology, psychology and psychiatry. But for the majority of his patients, his credentials weren't important, they just knew that he was the man to be treated by, the Napoleon of Neurosis, as he was known. He was such a rock star of 19th century Paris that it became quite fashionable for otherwise well ladies of society to be diagnosed as hysterics by Dr. Charcot. Much like Edward Jordan before him, Charcot wished to dispel the myth of witches and possessions. Charcot was trying to prove that hysteria was a real disease with organic origin and not just bored housewives who'd gone off their rocker or young girls looking to be the next Joan of Arc. For Charcot, hysteria was a hereditary neurological disorder, and so he wanted to create the definitive list of symptoms and triggers for hysteria. He eventually described hysteria as having four clearly defined periods that made up all hysterical attacks. Number one was tonic rigidity, the body seizing up much like in an epileptic fit. Number two, the grand movements, 
big acrobatic displays of movement. Number three, passionate attitudes, grandiose gesture of terror, fear, ecstasy, but were quite often sexually based. And number four, delirium, just generally wandering around and crying a bit. These stages could last hours and the hysterical attacks themselves could last days or even months. We know so much about Charcot's work because it was so very well documented. He not only kept very detailed diaries and medical records, but he also photographed his patients extensively and released these to the general public. Which might seem unethical today, but it was a fairly common practice during the era. Chacor also held lectures on a Tuesday, demonstrating hysteria to the public. And these Tuesday lectures became quite famous in their own right. Ah, you saw my colleague previously. What was the issue there? Right, I saw him because I have a tremor that my doctor was concerned about. And he said that he was going to get me an MRI and see me again, but he just discharged me from the service. And I've recently been diagnosed with Ellis Danlos. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with that. Actually, I wrote my thesis on Ellis Danlos. Oh, great. Someone who knows what I'm talking about. So, I had a tilt table test which showed orthostatic hypertension, so dysautonomia is probably a factor too. And I know that's not your area. I just want a referral to the dysautonomia clinic. Orthostatic hypertension doesn't mean dysautonomia. Yeah, but studies show that three quarters of EDS patients have dysautonomia, so it would seem more likely that I had it than I didn't have it. Ellis Danlos patients don't suffer from dysautonomia. I have the research here. I can show you. I, I don't need to look at that. Can you bend your thumb to your wrist? Yeah, I can. Show me. I really don't want to. It doesn't end well for my thumbs, but I'll happily go through the rest of the baiting score with you. Well, I don't believe that you have Ellis Danlos. Excuse me? I don't believe you, and you're not willing to demonstrate that you have it, which further makes me believe that you don't. I was diagnosed by a rheumatologist after a prolonged investigation, and I've already told you I'll happily show you all my other joints. Just look. Well, I don't agree. You can't just come in here demanding diagnoses. Ellis Danlos patients often feel that we have to perform our disorder. I left that appointment mid-argument and without a referral because I refused to perform. Our mobile bodies can do a lot of interesting things, but most displays of hypermobility are actually damaging in the long run, and we're advised to not do tricks, even for other doctors, which can be a catch-22 situation because I've been repeatedly asked to prove my disorder by way of tricks, even if they do cause further pain in the short term and disability in the long. For some reason, having a rare disorder means that nobody actually believes that you have it. Charcot's patients performed their disorder too, intentionally or unintentionally. In these Tuesday lectures, Charcot would employ hypnosis to induce the women into a state of hysteria. He would further provoke the symptoms by using certain points on the body known as hysterogenic zones. For instance, pressing on the ovaries was quite likely to induce a bout of hysteria, although I think if anyone was pressing on my ovaries, I'd probably be hysterical too. Interestingly though, despite the female-centric zones, Charcot actually felt that hysteria was a condition that affected both men and women. In his early research, he actually claimed that far more men suffered from hysterical traits than women, and particularly linked hysteria to ex-soldiers, and perhaps was beginning to recognise what we'd now call PTSD. But the Tuesday lectures only featured women in part because Sao Petrier was a women's asylum at the time, but also because the wider medical community still denied hysteria as anything other than a woman's disease. Charcot was ridiculed in his own life for his work in hysteria, but he was adamant that the women exhibited in the Tuesday lectures were genuinely suffering from hysteria. But the overwhelming consensus from his contemporaries was that the girls were just good actresses. His favourite girls were all certainly very intelligent. There was another unexpected legacy to Charcot's work, and one that deepened the accusations that the Tuesday lectures were theatrical rather than medical. The demonstrations by his women were being recreated in the theatre. Charcot's lectures directly influenced regular attendees such as the actress Sarah Bernhardt or the artist Degas. The classical tropes that we have regarding women and fear and madness all come from Charcot's lectures. They influenced 
all areas of the arts, dance particularly, and if we look at some of the drawings of the grand movements, it's easy to see how. They look like the image of a dancer, and it's easy to turn them and the passionate attitudes into a beautiful piece of interpretive dance. Although, they also remind me of the stock rave dances, of big fish, little fish, cardboard, box, and somewhere in here, there is a Charcot rave. As enduring as this legacy is, I can't help thinking Charcot would have been a little disappointed by it. Although he was trying to dispel the image of hysteria, he inadvertently created a new one in its place and firmly confirmed the female hysteric. Chapter 5 Victorian England So let's leave France and come back to Victorian England, a time of big skirts and silly hats and see what else is happening with those stiff upper lips. Well, pretty much the same thing that's been happening for centuries before. Whilst doctors like Charcot were moving forward, incorrectly but forward still, the general consensus regarding hysteria was very firmly rooted in the past, or simply that young women just needed to get laid. But Christian ideology forbade unmarried women from having sex, and since a lot of hysterical patients were young, respectable, unmarried women, what were doctors to do? Well, the first recommendation was to get her married and quick, because a married woman was a sexual woman, and even better still, was a pregnant woman. These ideas all hark back to the wandering womb of ancient Greece. Filling the womb with a baby pinned it down, stopped it causing problems. It also worked quite well to control your wife. But what if there was no husband available? Maybe you're a widow or your husband can't fulfill his marital duties. Maybe you just don't want to have sex with your bloated syphilitic <laughs> husband, which in and itself is a symptom of hysteria. Because remember ladies, if you want to have too much sex, you're hysterical. If you don't want to have any sex at all, you're hysterical. The only right way to have sex is when your husband commands it. Up until the 20th century, the general consensus from male doctors was that the female orgasm was an entirely practical and mechanical reaction to sex, the merry poppins of sexual activity. Only men gained pleasure from sex, only men had orgasms. Women had paroxysms, which is a delightful way of describing a spasm or contraction. The paroxysm acted as a switch to release the hysterical energy. So, in order to treat a hysteric, one must give her a paroxysm. You will have noticed a pattern here that nothing has changed in regard to women's health for millennia. So here's an example from 1546, which could have been taken straight from a Victorian handbook. A widow, 44, was taken for dead. I was called to her. It was a case of suffocation of retained seed. Because of the urgency of the situation, we asked a midwife to come and apply ointment to the patient's genitals, rubbing them inside with her finger. And thus, she was against all hope brought back to consciousness. I particularly like the qualifying statement afterwards. For such titillation with the finger is commended by all physicians particularly for widows and persons abstaining like nuns. Less so for younger and servant women or those with a husband. For them, a better remedy is to sleep with a man. So, how were doctors going to titillate their patients in a respectful manner? Ooh. There were instructions such as this and this, all very respectable, patient fully dressed, doctor with his head turned, never inspecting the patient. But Victorian era doctors weren't massively keen on this practice. Their main complaint that it took an awfully long time for the woman to experience a paroxysm and their hands and wrists were getting tired. Boo hoo. But the Victorians were an innovative people. They always had a solution to a problem and their solution was this. Ladies and gentlemen, the medical massager now commonly known as the vibrator. I think this one is particularly terrifying. There are also many using the Victorians' favourite new toy, electricity. Here's an example of two young girls titillating each other. The Victorians were a notoriously prudish society, and maybe you would expect that these vibrators were a prescription-only, a hush-hush kind of a deal. 
But because doctors didn't believe in the female orgasm, there were no sexual connotations associated with them. And adverts for vibrators pop up in newspapers, women's magazines, and anywhere else a respectable lady might gather information. And we women folk got away with it for decades, up until the early porn films of the 1920s. These films showed the actresses using vibrators to get off and shock horror, they were banned shortly after. <clears throat> There's one final chapter to our history of hysteria and we have to look back quickly once more to Charcot. Charcot noted that many of his patients had suffered some form of trauma, often sexual, in their early lives. He believed that under hypnosis what was done could be undone, which will sound familiar to any of you with a little knowledge of psychology. The problem with Charcot's method was that he focused too much on the actual bodies of his patients. He never really spoke to them. But one of his students took the idea of hypnosis and took the idea of undoing what was done and ran with it. And that student was Sigmund Freud. Chapter 6 So Freud, Freud, Sigmund Freud, one of the greatest minds of his generation, possibly one of the greatest minds in history, and absolutely obsessed with sex. But he's also famous for his work regarding hysteria. His opinions and views changed over the years. When Freud began his work and published the famous studies on hysteria with Joseph Breuer, he aimed to treat the individual symptoms of hysteria. And he believed that most cases of hysteria were caused by sexual trauma. Freud's ideas around the treatment of hysteria were generally far more sensible when he was working with Breuer. By the time we get to Dora at the turn of the century, Freud is instead looking for the neuroses that underpin the hysteria and believes that most cases of hysteria to be caused by repressed sexual fantasies rather than trauma. Freud's later theories basically boil down to one point, with the root of all neuroses beginning with a person wanting to kill one parent and marry the other. This was particularly true of Dora. Dora is one of the most famous women in the history of psychology and psychiatry. She was 16 the first time she saw Freud, and 18 when she became the subject of Freud's analysis of a case of hysteria. She had suffered with a lifetime of hysterical symptoms, particularly a nervous cough, but also including lethargy and apathy. The most important one to Freud, though, was sexual repulsion. Ew. Dora's real name was Ida Bauer. She was an intelligent young woman who wished to study rather than be drawn into domestic life. She came from a complicated family. Her father suffered greatly with his health, partially due to a bout of syphilis as an unmarried man, and her mother cleaned obsessively, to the point that she ignored all other aspects of her life, including Dora. But Dora did clearly have mental health issues as we would recognise them today. OK, Ms Buckle, could you describe why you're here today? Um, well, I'm having these issues where I can't breathe, and my doctor thinks it's vocal cord dysfunction, and he's looked into speech therapy, but the referral has to come through you. Have you seen a chest specialist? No, as I said, my doctor thinks it's vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, what did you call it? Vocal cord dysfunction? Tell me in your own words what happens. Well, I have these episodes where I can't breathe. Well, I can breathe out, but I can't breathe in at all. I just can't catch my breath. OK. Uh, tongue out? Uh, how much alcohol do you consume? Not much, only now and then. <laughs> I think you're not telling me the truth. I'm sorry? I think you're a drinker. OK, but I'm not. If you say so. I, I can't imagine you have anything wrong with your vocal cords. I, I think you're having panic attacks. I want to prescribe you antidepressants. See if that helps with the panic attacks. I can assure you that these episodes are not panic attacks. I am not currently suffering from anxiety and you're not going to prescribe me unneeded medication. Well, that's the thing with anxiety. The patient often doesn't realise they're anxious and you are getting rather worked up. I was getting rather worked up. I left that appointment in tears, angry, confused and invalidated. It took another four years of failed medications and wasted appointments before a specialist confirmed, yes, you're a classic case of vocal cord dysfunction, which is basically like having an asthma attack without the asthma. In my case, it's most likely linked to dysautonomia, 
My body overreacts to small triggers like someone's perfume or a temperature change, and it causes my vocal cords to shut completely, stopping any air from coming in. And I do understand why that might seem like a panic attack to the uneducated eye. Being chronically ill becomes a cat and mouse game with doctors. So often you have the label of hypochondriac thrust upon you that you feel you must never mention your mental health. The minute you admit you might feel anxious or depressed is the minute a doctor stops listening. But it's a double-edged sword, because even if you're fine, doctors presume otherwise, because depression is an easy catch-all diagnosis. Ellisdale and his patients, however, do often suffer from depression and anxiety, especially before diagnosis. Because having EDS is like being brutally hung over at a family function. You're knackered, you're nauseous, Everything bloody hurts, and people keep saying, smile, love, could be worse. Freud had some pretty controversial things to say for the turn of the century. And another hundred years or so later, some of them are frankly abhorrent. But it seems unfair to give the man a trial without a jury. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Sigmund Freud. Hi. Hi. Hello, Ziggy. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I've got some of your case notes on Dora here with some of your facts and findings, and I was hoping you could share some of them with the audience. First off, how would you define a hysteric? I should, without question, consider a person hysterical in whom an occasion for sexual excitement, elicited feelings that were predominantly or exclusively unpleasurable. And I should do so whether or no the person were capable of producing somatic symptoms. So what you're saying, Zig, is that if she's not into it, she's crazy. Yeah, that is the only logical assumption. Huh? Dora was 14 the first time she was kissed by Herr K. Herr K was husband to Frau K, the lover of Dora's father. Dora maintained the stance that she felt her father had sold her to Herr K in order to continue his affair. Neither he nor Freud believed that Herr K had done anything untoward with Dora. Freud felt that it was impossible for a woman not to be instantly flattered and turned on by physical contact unless there was something wrong with her, unless she was hysterical. It is incomprehensible to me that Dora was so perturbed by her interactions with Herr K. Surely she had been giving some small signs of her affection. Otherwise, why would Herr K have tried to kiss her? Rebecca rolls her eyes. So you're saying Dora didn't know her own mind when it came to Herr K? So, so woman in girlhood could use sickness to manipulate her father and so too, in womanhood, for your sickness to manipulate her husband and those around her. In Dora's case, she wished to manipulate her father and detach him from his mistress. And so, Dora created these symptoms in order to obtain his attention. So Dora was faking it, including the persistent cough she'd had since childhood. In the hysteric, each individual symptom signifies the representation, the realisation of a fantasy with sexual content. That is to say, it signifies a sexual situation. As Dora's cough became worse with her father's absence, it would be logical to suggest that her cough represented her repressed sexual feelings towards her father. Ew. Furthermore, I would say her cough came from the association of the oral cavity as a method of sexual fulfillment. Eventually, Dora came to agree with my findings and her cough stopped. Did you not ever worry, Zig, that by constantly talking about sex with your patients, you might be leading them in some conclusion to conclude that all their problems were related to sex? Mm. There is never any danger of corrupting an inexperienced girl, for where there is no knowledge of sexual processes, even in the unconscious, no hysterical his symptoms will arise. And where hysteria is found, there can no longer be any question of innocence of life. Mm, and this 
went on and on, a whole book blaming Dora for her own misfortunes. And if she'd just give in and sleep with her cane, then everything would be fine. I'd recommend reading Dora at some point. It's an interesting read. We're all labelled sexual perverts at heart, but it will enrage you, or it should. Freud talks a lot about somatic compliance, the act of the body giving in to sexual situations even if the mind resists them, and this being an indication that women unconsciously do always want to have sex even if their conscious mind is unwilling. And any mind that is unwilling is obviously defective, is hysterical. In the 20th century, lesbians were often diagnosed as hysterics for this very reason. And how many times have we heard this argument used against the victims of sexual assault? There's one more thing in his case of analysis that struck me as familiar. It was the notion that as a doctor you want to avoid labelling people because they'll use that label as an excuse. Freud wrote, Let us imagine a workman, a bricklayer, let us say, who has fallen off a house and been crippled, and now earns his livelihood by begging at the street corner. Let us then suppose that a miracle worker comes along and promises him to make his crooked legs straight and capable of walking. It would be unwise, I think, to look forward to seeing an expression of peculiar bliss upon his face. No doubt at the time of the accident he felt he was extremely unlucky when he realised that he would never be able to do any more work and would have to starve or live upon charity. But since then, the very thing which in the first instance threw him out of his employment has become a source of income. He lives by his disablement. If that is taken from him, he may become totally helpless. He has, in the meantime, forgotten his trade and lost his habits of industry. He has become accustomed to idleness and perhaps to drink as well. This is particularly galling when you have a chronic illness and chronic fatigue. You're so often told that you're lazy or indulge in your illness in an attempt not to do things when the opposite is true. So ultimately, the history of hysteria isn't that hilarious. It's a history of maltreatment and misdiagnosis and much bigger than I can cover in this lecture. Hysteria started as a way to explain a very specific female condition and ultimately became a way to dismiss and control women. Its legacy is a long one and women are treated differently in mainstream medicine. Recent studies have shown women are 10 times more likely to die of a heart attack because their symptoms aren't taken seriously. Studies in the US show women on average wait 30 minutes longer than men to be prescribed pain medication in an ER setting. Female specific diseases have longer diagnosis times. The average diagnosis time for endometriosis is seven to eight years and women are still regularly advised to have babies in order to relieve their symptoms, which sounds familiar, doesn't it? Most worryingly of all, we are seeing the womb once again being used to strip away the rights of women. Hysteria was only dropped as a diagnosis by the American Psychiatric Society in the 1950s, and hysterical conversion disorder, much like Freud's diagnosis of Dora, only left the DSM, the Bible of psychological disorders in the 1980s. So it's still in the memory of many of our doctors. And whilst, yes, there are people who suffer from true psychosomatic illnesses, I'd wager they're a lot rarer than my rare disease. There's no up-to-date information about how many people are affected by hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos because the funding just isn't there. But the general consensus is that hypermobile Eds isn't that rare at all, just underdiagnosed. There's no care pathway for Ehlers-Danlos in the NHS. Most EDS patients have to scrimp and save to be seen privately in order to receive basic treatment. And many fall foul to medical gaslighting and never get diagnosed at all. There's only so many appointments where you can be told it's all in your head before you start to believe them. Why are you here? My doctor diagnosed me with fibromyalgia and he wants to get a confirmation of diagnosis. Well, I don't believe in fibromyalgia, so there's nothing I can do for you. Oh, um, but... That'll be all, Miss Buckle. 
Before we leave, I just want to mention one more thing that I believe has become our modern version of hysteria, and that's the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. I was diagnosed in my early 20s and it was a blessing and a curse. I now had a name for what I was experiencing, but every time I mentioned it, I did so with an apologetic shrug because I knew just how many people didn't believe it existed. A lot of hysteria symptoms are identical to fibromyalgia and nobody quite knows what the cause is, so it's easy to write off as psychological. And even easier still to write off as 80 to 90% of the sufferers are women. And much as if I'd been diagnosed with hysteria, once I had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, every symptom I had was written off as being part of fibromyalgia, which is a very dangerous approach to take when many of the symptoms of fibromyalgia are the same as common cancers such as ovarian and bowel. A study undertaken by UCL in 2017 showed that women with bowel cancer, despite going to the doctor more frequently for their symptoms, were less likely to be diagnosed with bowel cancer than men, being fobbed off with a diagnosis of IBS without proper investigation. And over a third of women are diagnosed in an emergency setting when it's just too late. Doctors are great. We'd be dead without them, but they're not infallible. And I am an expert in my own disease. I am an expert in my own body. The more we can know our bodies, the more we can push back. And the more we can push back, the more we can banish the legacy of hysteria so that those with chronic illnesses can actually get diagnosed. So you can cry in life-changing appointments without being dismissed. Because diagnosis is awesome. It hasn't put me in a box. It hasn't made me feel sorry for myself. It hasn't driven me to drink and idleness. It's made me feel empowered. It's given me a confidence that I never knew I could have and I no longer beat myself up about what my body can't do because now I have a reason for it. And I am proud of what my body can do. And most importantly of all, it means that I now know... She removes her hysterical woman necklace. ...that I am no longer a hysterical woman. Darkness. Hysterical. A hilarious history of hysteria. A digital lecture. Written and performed by Rebecca Buckle. Director, Mina Barber. Videography and post-production, Ben Pugh. Sound design, Jeremy George. Graphic design, Sophie Carpenter. Motion animation, Tim Porter. Captioning, Suzanne Beastie. Audio describers, Ali Clark and Ruth James. Audio description sound engineer, Gary Giles. ESL interpreter, Jackie Beckford. Newham, London. Arts Council, England. Stratford East.